Hello and welcome to Quality Policing. I am Peter Moskos and I'm here today with Laura Huey, a professor of sociology at the University of Western Ontario. And um, she specializes in uh, policing and mental health and countering violent extremism. And she was also one of the um, first contributors to my Violence Reduction Project, which is a collection of essays you can uh, link to at uh, qualitypolicing.com. And um, thanks, thanks for joining me. Thanks for offering me the opportunity to, to talk, because you know academics, we love to talk. So too, because we usually we have a captive audience, but that's not the case with podcasts. They can stop us at any time. I know. So it's now incumbent on me to be as interesting as humanly possible so that people don't click away. Whereas my poor students, you're right, they're trapped. <laughs> um, I, I think what your work is very interesting. So I'm not worried about that. Um, so you, you wrote of uh, your essay is on something um, called supportive reporting, which is a phrase um, either because I'm ignorant or because I'm American. Um, I didn't know what that meant when I first read it. Can you describe um, describe what it is? Absolutely. So supportive reporting is the term I read, of course, all academic, another academic trick. We take something that had a perfectly good name the first time and we rename it. <laughs> so that people go, oh, QE supportive reporting. Um, I actually renamed this program. It was originally called remote reporting or third party reporting. And it comes out of uh, Edinburgh, actually a, a former police service there called the Lothian and Borders Police Service. There was a chief inspector, Gavin Buist. And many, many years ago, as a wee academic pup, I was in Scotland doing part of my PhD field research, and I had the opportunity to, to talk to Buist, who was like really bubbling with enthusiasm for this new remote reporting program he had created. And the background behind it was, I can't remember exactly, but I think it was a family member of his was gay and had been talking about a series of bashings that had been happening in the LGBTQ community and that people were afraid We've heard this across multiple communities. People were afraid to report to the police. And so because Buist was hearing about this, and of course, um, police officer, empathy, insight, understanding through engagement with the community, began to work with the community on, well, if you're afraid to call 911 or 999, um, what can we do to increase our awareness of what's going on and ideally reduce some of the victimization that you're experiencing. And what he came up with was this strategy whereby you have community groups and social service organizations that work within the LGBTQ community and are trusted by members of that community because they've been there for a long time and built up that relationship. Those people get special training on how to take a report that they would then forward on to the police. So this is an alternative reporting mechanism. Um, third party policing confused the whole thing. Remote reporting, people weren't quite sure what does that mean. So I've reframed it supportive reporting because the role of the service provider is to provide that initial support to the victim and encourage them to come forward to the police. And you can come forward in one of two ways. And I think this is really important. You can come forward with the help of a service provider and say, yes, I want this person charged. I, I want to be involved in this case as a, as a you know, victim witness, right? Or you can come forward anonymously. So you can let the police know that there's something going on within the local community so that they can start to build some intelligence on this, um, but without compromising your identity or being worried that you'd be sucked into an investigation. And we can talk about the many, many reasons why people don't report and why they might be afraid to get sucked into a police investigation. I'd like to touch on that, but I guess my first question is, does this take police off the hook? I mean, shouldn't the focus be on police to so that people are willing to call them or I mean or is or you know am I 
sort of picking problems here that needn't be picked because we have a good solution? What's I'm going to go with option number B. <laughs> Here's the thing. Um, there are a lot of misconceptions about, about policing. If you don't know anything about policing and your only experience of a police officer is the dare talk in grade six, I think you guys get it in this case, or getting a ticket or please show up to break up your frat party, you don't really understand. In fact, last night when the deputy chiefs hit Vancouver posted um, thanking a 10 year old for calling 911 because the 10 year old saw somebody attacking a police officer. And I said, I hope you guys make a big fuss about this kid because it's scary picking up the phone and calling 911. I've worked with cops for 20 years, um, have many friends who are, are police officers, and even I would be a little freaked out about calling 911 because you're initiating a mechanism, you don't know what the, the outcome is going to be. So if you're freaked out about that, if you are concerned that you might not be believed by the police, and a lot of, especially women, are afraid to come forward because they feel that they won't be believed. There's um, been a lot of media reporting, especially, especially around sexual assault victimization that highlights many of the reasons why women might be afraid to come forward. Same thing with domestic violence. Um, you might also be afraid to report directly because, you know, let's face it, in the communities in which I work, which are inner city urban communities, there's a no snitching code. And you don't want to be seen with the police because street justice is going to be a hell of a lot faster than the criminal justice system. So I might want to tell the police that there's a strong arm, there's a series of strong arms going on in my community but I don't want to like pick up the phone. I don't want to show up at the police station or grab a cop who's walking by. So those are some of the very quick reasons why you might want to come forward, but not in a conventional way. Does supportive reporting cover other, that type of crime and witness you just talked about, or is it exclusively focused on LGBT communities and other? And so if you go to, um, uh, Policing in Scotland went through a major reformation in the 2000s, and all the regional police services were amalgamated into something called Police Scotland. If you go to the Police Scotland website, what you'll see is a web page full of different types of community groups who are involved in supportive reporting. One of the ones that I was blown away by, but I thought, this is fantastic, the deaf community. So um, anti uh, attacks against people who are, are deaf or other abled, or um, there's also um, different ethnic groups, different religious groups. It basically can be used by any community that is disproportionately the victim of crime and might have hesitancy about coming forward. And we certainly see this among immigrant communities, particularly communities where you, know, you come from a place where you don't want to be involved with the police. And so this very much relates to the concept of um, police legitimacy, obviously. Do you phrase it in that context or is there some, some academic feud or you know, some, some weird schism I don't even know about? How, how, how does it fit into that? I don't see it as a police legitimacy issue. I can understand why a lot of academics and some police officers might see it that way. But the problem is we, and I, you know, 20 years of talking about this, we treat policing as a one size fits all solution for far too many social problems. And the reality is you can, you can um, zhoosh up, that's a little term for anybody that likes to watch those shows where they make people over. You can zhoosh up the police as much as you want and make them off, all officer friendly and so on. Um, but at the end of the day, you are still going to have communities that will be underserved by the police for historical, social, economic, and other reasons. You can, I've seen police agencies work tremendously hard at building up relations within those communities. But I'm telling you, the community I know the best is what's called Skid Row. And um, I've seen police agencies, Vancouver, you know, I know a lot of activists are, are now clicking away from this discussion. But um, in the 20 some odd years that I've watched Vancouver in dealing with uh, the downtown Eastside, which is a skid row community in Vancouver, they've made tremendous 
attempt at trying to bridge some of the gaps with that community. But if you're dealing with street-based communities, whether it's Skid Row, whether or not it's uh, gang territories and so on, there's only so much police legitimacy that is going to cure the lack of reporting problem that we have. Well, it also strikes me as a big difference and a big improvement from well, I don't even want to say similar programs, but programs that come to my mind dealing with um, some, I don't want to even group all violence interrupters because they're different forms of it, but it strikes me as ironic and somewhat counterproductive that the same people that say, that talk about the need for greater police legitimacy, legitimacy sometimes work to undermine it by setting up a parallel system in which these organizations are specifically, um, you know, formed and operated to not interact with the police. And I'm not enough of an ideologue, like if it works, uh, fine. Okay, I, you know, I, I, I can let go of my sort of <laughs> theoretical objection, but it seems like a weird vision. At some point you have to bring these, you have to bridge the gap and not work to in fact reinforce it, which I think a lot of these sort of alternative systems do. So the, I like the idea that yes, we're here to help you um, but then we do give, then we give the report to the police because this is what they do. Um, yeah. and, and that seems like a very useful, uh, like, well, a useful distinction in, in, in doing this is bringing people into the system. Well, one of the things that's really interesting about the Edinburgh system when it, when it was developed was that, and, and this is going to vary by city, I get it, but Edinburgh worked really tremendously, the police at LMB worked tremendously hard at building up community policing within their, their inner city areas. And I know everybody goes you to just Edinburgh. Say, I'm sorry, you said LNB, I have to do an acronym oh, check. Lothian and Borders Police Service. Thank you. Um, have you ever been to Edinburgh? I have, I have. I went there for the Fringe Festival. Isn't long, it gorgeous? Long, long ago. It was a little gray, but it's gorgeous. Um, it's got gray stone so. to match the gray sky and super friendly people. Exactly. So you were probably on the Royal Mile and you saw the castle and you saw all that stuff. So did you go to an area called Cowgate or the Grass Market? I don't remember, but I generally, when I travel, I make a point to go to the to what is considered the bad part of town. So I think I probably did. So I, uh, well, it's not, it's, it's not that far from the Royal Mile. And when I, the very first time I went, I went to the tourist bureau and said, hi, I hope um, I'm looking for like so some of your worst neighborhoods. Could you tell me where, if I was interested, I could walk heroin. <laughs> and this woman, she's like, just a second. She went in, got her supervisor to come out and then asked me, what, what, like, what exactly are you doing? And they sent me to um, the, the Calgate Grass Market area of Edinburgh. Most people aren't, when we think of cities like that, we don't think of them typically, unless we're criminologists, um, we don't think of them in terms of like the bad parts of the town, but all cities of course have those. And um, within uh, the Lothian Borders Police Service, they made conscious, they actually in about the late 1990s switched their police response from this is going to blow your mind, 60% community, 40% response. In other words, 60% of their frontline personnel were doing community engaged work and 40% were in cars responding to calls. Can you imagine that happening in the United States and somewhere like Philadelphia? Well, you could if you looked at the police department overall, perhaps. If you look at the half, I'm thinking, maybe it's a different division because they don't have as many specialized units. Um, I'm just thinking out loud here. I don't know. Um, I'm also thinking, isn't Cowgate part of the Fringe Festival? I think I spent a lot of time there. Sorry, I'm still, still uh, thinking. Uh, for all the, that's where all the, I hate to bring, bring this up, but kids, that's where all the strip clubs are. <laughs> so I'm not sure what was going on at the Fringe Festival when you were there. But, um, but the reason why I bring this up is because what they did was they had cops walk, and you could do this in chunks of Ember. You could have cops walking beat pretty much anywhere in the downtown core. And what they did was they were tasked with specifically building relationships with community service providers. So shelter workers, um, places that feed food to the homeless and so on. And um, as a consequence of that, the relationship, which is often antagonistic between social service agencies and the police, 
wasn't antagonistic. They saw themselves as being two sides of a similar coin. That was a bad analogy. So am I am I correct in saying that so the, what they're doing is it's not direct outreach, but they're doing outreach to the agencies instead. Exactly. 100%. And so, and what the, and what, instead of the cops going and going, Hey, kids, we're your friend. The agencies would be the ones that would put forward the police legitimacy argument and, and build the help build it, build that trust yeah. up in the community. That makes a lot of sense. Um, which is not something I often find myself saying when it comes to police operations. Uh, what is internally, how does, the police department, how do they judge or do that, you know, do they quantify this? How do they judge success? How do they know cops are out there working? What, what's the um, management supervision on a program like this? Because I can see it going off the rails pretty quickly. So what we did is I was there in 2000 when this was first started up. And then I went back in about 2007, 2008, we did follow up. And what we discovered was that the over, overall volume of, of uh, reports was not significant. And that the number of successes were actually pretty low. But if you just quantify it rather than also qualifying it, um, then yeah, it doesn't look like it did much. But when you discover the cases that were actually successful, we had in, in Edinburgh, they had this um, one small gang that were targeting recent immigrants from the EU. They were strong arming them for their checks. They'd show up, beat the crap out of them and take their checks. And no, everybody was so afraid to complain. Well, there were probably realistically hundreds and hundreds of victims um, be, at, that were potentially could have reported but didn't. And by getting that intelligence through, they were actually able to, take, to stop this gang. So in terms of quantity, it's one success, but in terms of the quality of life for the people, it's, it's I would argue it, it's really difficult to measure. But I mean, I ask not to criticize it because I don't like quantifying police work. Um, I think in fact, good police work can't be quantified, but that makes it a tough sell. Uh, so how do you prevent it from, from becoming, I mean, so that usually if things can't be quantified, it depends on the support of the top person. So how do you prevent it from being the flavor of the month and the next, uh, what's the head of the police force there called? I don't know the title. Um, the, chief constable. The, the, the next chief constable, um, you know, once, you know, has to do his or her own thing. So they, they end it. How, how, is there any way to institutionalize it so it survives? Well, it has been institutionalized successfully in Scotland because here we are 21 years later and the that program counts. has expanded, right? Yeah. Um, and I know exactly what you mean about the flavor of the month thing because I see it over and over again. But once something's been sort of part of what's necessary to do something like this is a culture shift. And so they underwent a significant culture shift and some parts of it were successful and some parts weren't. Um, but once that culture has shifted, it's very difficult to roll it back. And so it's been, um, and also it helps to have some decent politicians that are making the right decisions in terms of appointing the next chief constable and an executive team. But they were really good at, at showcasing what the work was all about and getting that broader community support and the police weren't just, by the way, involved in activities like that. They were also working with other groups uh, to do things like to get uh, kids that were at high, high at risk youth involved in activities like operating a hot, da hot dog stand. You're like, what the hell, hot dog stand? Guess what? It taught them about entrepreneurship. It gave them marketable skills. So it, it wasn't just one piece. It was part of a larger fabric. And I've argued, we tried to introduce this here in Canada in about 2007, 2008. And we went to two different major police services and I've, I've written about this extensively. Uh, we went to Toronto and we went to Vancouver and we talked to police officers in both organizations. Uh, Toronto was a little bit more of a top sell. I don't, you know, nothing happened. Vancouver was open to it. Ironically, neither organization ended up adopting it, but in BC, British Columbia, um, that's a province for you Americans. Uh, I knew that, right thank above, you very much. <laughs> right above Washington State. <laughs> um, 
they adopted the uh, version of third party reporting for women who have been victims of sexual assault who are afraid to come forward. And that's been operating through that through the province and through the RCMP for a few years now. So we're starting to see little bits and pieces of it. I don't ideally it would be great to have it as part of a giant culture shift, but I think you can also take pieces of it and sustain that over time. Sorry, it was a long answer for well, a short. I, I, and, and I want to get back to culture shifts, so don't let me forget. But first, I want to ask: did, did, Has the Scottish police have they? Um, dealt with the same budget cuts that the police in England and Wales have dealt with over the past decade? Everybody's been hit in different ways. Even up here in Canada, we, in some respects, we've been a bit immune from what's been happening in the U.S., but not, not, um, but that's only because through successive budgets, attrition, and so on, we've been struggling. So, yeah. yeah. I, I, I even mean preceding current events and defund, because um, I spent a semester at um, Ramshill AKA the National Police College when it existed in Bramshill in 2011, I think. And that was just the start of a five year uh, massive budget cut, which the pro and I'm, the reason I bring this up is because usually when budgets are cut, the things that get cut are things like the National Policing College that I was at, which now doesn't exist in that form. Um, how does a program like this survive budget cuts? Because, you know, people are still calling 999 for police services, right? So you, you can't cut that, God forbid. So everything, all, sort of all the good stuff gets cut um, around the edges. And I mean, the, the root of the problem is, uh, which is universal in policing is, is you know, roughly 80% of the budget goes to labor. And yeah, you can cut that through attrition, uh, but it's, it's tough to cut a police budget because you're dealing, because it's, it's about labor. One last thing, at least in England, they did it with a plan. They didn't just vindictively cut budgets one year. You know, they, the Home Office set up a plan and, you know, police bitched about it, but whatever, it, they were able to be part of the process. But so I take it this program did survive the budget cut. Um, any magic to that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, there is some magic to that. This is a, once you get the program initially set up, which involves creating training materials, training the people to take the reports guess what the whole thing can be run on pretty much zero budget once it's in place because here's what happens and what, there's a few police services here that have been experimenting with versions of this so say you've got somebody who's off because they've shattered their leg in 45 places um, and so oftentimes you find try to find a desk job for them and one of the things that I won't name the police service, but one of my favorite police services in Canada has done is they've said, you know, instead of just having people call 911, you know, fill out the form online, why don't we also have try to come up with a system where we can take some of the lower priority calls and have the person at the desk deal with them? So there's no additional budget cost of having that person do it. You get that sense that, oh, an actual police officer called me. So you have that warm, fuzzy feeling police legitimacy thing inside and you kill two birds with one stone with no additional cost. Well, and the genius, um, I don't want to say this is a cynical ploy, but what seems like it's happened there is the police get other people to do their work for them. I don't want to say do their work, but other people are filling, other agencies are filling out these forms. And so you're offloading some of the work to other agencies where at least in America, when these any cooperation is set up, it usually is other agencies offloading their work to police departments. So that's a very clever gambit there by the police department to be able to do that. Say, hey, will you do our paperwork for us? Um, you know, leaving aside all the advantages of, of reporting and, and legitimacy. Um, the culture shift. Um, I, I tell me how how did it change um was it intentional or just what you know what was the cause and what was the effect the the cause was uh well there was a larger political shift in scotland and it took place in the 1990s and um essentially what happened was the scottish the entire scottish system sort of devolved from from the the uk model and you start to see a Scottish Ministry of Justice and interested in Scottish policing and interest in Scottish criminal law. 
And so seeing this as an opportunity to remake the system in a way that worked better for the Scottish people. And Scotland politically tends to run a little bit more left than other parts of the UK. And so they were interested in a much more inclusive society. And part of that was rethinking how policing is done. And so the, the traditional 3R approach, the, there was a concrete plan put in place to jettison that and to move towards, as I said, a 60-40 split in terms of how frontline patrol would be deployed. Again, I want to be clear, I, I, you know, that's shifted over time, of course, as different things take place, but also um, the geography of Edinburgh is a little bit different than I've been in some US cities and it's like, oh my God, it's three hours to get from one end of town to the other. I, I get that. Um, Edinburgh is a three-dimensional city was one of my impressions. I'm like, oh, I have to get up there. In some ways, it, the only comparable city, and it's not as extreme, I would say, there's a little bit of that in Pittsburgh. Um, but yeah, it's a weird, <laughs> it's multi-level. <laughs> I know, you better be in good shape if you're walking around Edinburgh, that's for damn sure. You look on the map and you I say, I should be there. And then you realize it's 200 feet down. <laughs> Up or down. Yeah. Um, but you know, part of it was in terms of this culture shift, I interviewed, I spent time like on beat with uh, these officers and interviewed those officers. And they actually, you know, I'm gonna be very blunt, you know this, what the management tell you and what the frontline officers actually do are often two very different things. So they'll tell you, I was in San Francisco where uh, back in 2000 where management was telling me, yeah, we do community policing, it's fantastic. And in the front line, they were saying, we don't do that shit, are you kidding me? <laughs> and yeah. they would laugh, right? So in, in Edinburgh, that complete culture shift was bought into at all, ranks and, and because so it worked or because like, they had mandatory in-service training no no mandatory in-service training does squat you <laughs> that's know, why i mentioned that word because i that was what, I was, what yeah. I was assuming you would say no no it's tied to it's member carrot and stick it's tied to the carrot side of the equation so you used to get re rewarded for good arrests which you still did in Scotland, but you also got arrested for, or arrested, you got, you got the carrot for building good community relations. You got a letter from a community group talking about how wonderful you were. Oh, carrot for you. So those things got counted. So, you know, what's that expression? What gets counted counts or something? That's it. Know, yeah. But. Yeah. You know, um, many years ago, again, I was um, doing a walk along with police in Amsterdam in the red light district and I was asking the cop how, you know, just making conversation. I was like, how many arrests did you make um, last month? And he had to pause. And he's, you know, he started counting. He's like, I don't know, two. Um, what about like the whole year? And he, he said, well, I mean, he, he could, you know, there weren't that many. He could, he could kind of remember them all mostly. I said, you don't keep track of it? And he said, no. I mean, he said, yeah, I mean, someone, they're obviously there, there's paperwork involved. I said, but it's not, you know, it's not in America. If you ask a cop how, in the last work period how many arrests they could ma they made, they could tell you. Um, and I thought that was fascinating. He said, "No, we're not judged on that." Um, and I said, "Wow, what if you just take that out of the equation and you can change police culture?" And you know, it wasn't that he wasn't doing real police work, um, but it wasn't judged by arrests. What percent of the Scottish force are women? Is it? Do you know? I don't know off the top of my head, but at the time it probably would have been about, I want to say between 15 and 20%. Okay. Cause there, there's some literature and common sense that when it hits 20%, there's a culture change as well. Um, uh, and I, I was wondering if that maybe played a role. Um, well, I, well, I will say one thing about the um, reward system that I, I'm working on some research right now to do with policing and mental health. And my colleague who did extensive uh, field research for like two different on with two different police services and I'm reading through her field notes and what you see over and over again is that police officers chasing quotas because it's expected, but really not feeling good about it. 
it's like, I have to do this to satisfy, you know, this requirement, but I, I don't want to be doing this. And I wonder how much, like, if we could replace the compensation or the reward or the promotion system with something that um, actually makes better sense for the communities, but also improve police morale internally as well. Yeah, I always thought one of the requirements for getting promoted to sergeant is um, a letter of recommendation from somebody who's in the community and you get extra credit if it's actually somebody you once arrested. Um, but it should be, you know, that shouldn't be everything, but it should be part, it, it matters. It should be in there, at least recognized um, if you have those connections. Um, yeah, the whole, like the quota system, I mean, I, I know in New York City, the brass of the department is, so, they're actually right now they're, they're not so terrified, but generally they're terrified that cops aren't doing anything. It's how do we get them to work? Um, and my thought was, first of all, if, it's one thing if you're a lazy cop, but if you're a bad cop, it might be better if you don't work than if we force, than if we give you a quota and force you to do stuff. <laughs> but even if you're just, you know, a below, you know, ha look, half of cops are below average. Even if you're just a below average, but decent cop and a decent person, um, just as a management thing, you, you, morale is so, well, morale is always low in the police world, right? It's just a question of if it's low or lowest, but um, you're, you wanna get the best of these, officers, you know, and the best may not still be great, but at least it would be better. And the quota system, it just, it's so brutal because it just pisses people off. And then you've got disgruntled employees and you're never going to get the best out of them. Um, but maybe that's somehow inevitable in a paramilitary system, but I don't think it is. Um, okay. it's, there's a lack uh, of imagination there. I totally disagree. So first of all, I'm going to shout and give a shout out for our Canadian police officers who I think, um, and again, you know, I'm not just being biased because they like, oh, yay, Canada, but also I have studied policing in three different countries. So I have a little in different cities. In and which countries. countries are those? So that would be um, Scotland, uh, England, uh, the United States, and here, of course, in Canada. So I guess that's... You know, look, hold your thought for one second. I, I just, maybe I should explain because I can be like, oh, I, have, I know British Columbia is a province. Woo, woo, aren't I special? Um, I don't think it's expected that everyone knows the basic political system of, of, of the United Kingdom. Um, so let me give a 30 second uh, lecture on that. Uh, the United Kingdom, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the United Kingdom currently consists of England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Um, so each of those is a nation in their own way. Um, the, so the, the, the land mass of Great Britain, there is England, Wales, and Scotland. Um, Scotland has, you know, they have their own team in the Olympics or the World Cup at least. Uh, and, and they, you know, they share a lot of things but they are a, their own nation. And that's a, it's, it's a little bit of a fuzzy concept if you're used to strict nation state boundaries. But so the police force in Scotland is the Scottish police force as opposed to um, the police force which covers England, Wales and, and Northern Ireland. Exactly. But and I then interrupted then, you and I hope you kept your train. No, no, no. We, and the other thing too is I wanted, um, I was making my shout out for Canadian policing. So here's the thing, most, um, not un universally, but most police officers in Canada have uh, some level of, of um, undergraduate degree. Uh, many police officers have postgraduate degrees. Uh, most of them have some type of lifetime experience or life experience before they come in. Um, we generally, you know, I think we do a fairly decent job in terms of training, recruitment and training. Of course, there's always things that can be improved, no question. Um, but I think generally speaking, what I, I've I spent a lot of time in the field in some really weird places uh, watching police officers work. And one of the things I've seen over and over again, especially, and I'm gonna just, I'm gonna name a name here, especially in the RCMP, you get the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. So that's our national police force or federal police service that also is municipal and provincial in some places. They recruit the brightest and the best. And oftentimes what happens is then they get these, you get these kids that are super motivated. They want to get into the community and make a difference. And then you put them in the community and tell them they have to get X number of tickets today. They are dealing with the same problems over and over again with no solutions. 
um, they are not making a difference. In fact, even basic things like um, filing a police report can be in could be a, a because of lack of technology, lack of trust in the pe in 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 the frontline people to actually do things like use their own cell phone, right, to to take photographs of a crime scene, I mean, ridiculous things like that. And so what happens is you create this demoralized police service in which people are basically coming in and then they're like wanting to check out, and it's. That's the thing that Canada and the UK have in common. I heard a police, senior police leader in the UK say that we should start having an idea that if we can keep people in policing for, I think it was up to 10 years, that would be good. Yeah, think about that. Think about the intensive amount of money spent on recruitment and training. Canada's police training budget is probably about 900 million per year. We spend a lot of money on training. For a 10 year career, that's not a good investment. So if we can take some of this ridiculous stuff like with the quotas and the demoralizing aspects of policing with chasing, you know, chasing promotions or doing stupid things, I think we'd have a better uh, workplace and we'd have people that were actually much more creative in terms of problem solving because they'd have the space to do that. That's why you get people like Gavin Buis coming up with the supportive reporting program in Scotland, because he had the space and the support to do that. Scotland presumably um, has lateral entry into the higher ranks or does it? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Um, Canada, I assume, does not, right? Well, maybe, maybe I should say what lateral entry is. Um, in, in England, um, and it's, I, you know, at some point it's just related to the class system, uh, but it's kind of like the equivalent of an off, you know, officer in the military, but the higher ranks, they'll do some token time at the lower level, um, but you're basically hired to be an executive and that, you know, creates some resentment that these people have never actually done the job that we're doing, say the cops on the bottom. Um, but the idea is, well, that's a different job. And, I, you know, I, I don't, the American in me is kind of opposed to that idea, but I, you know, I, I don't really have a strong knowledge or opinion of it either way. See, the Canadian in me said jokingly at a, a dinner where there was a several high-ranking police, UK police officers and people from the college, jokingly said, if the condition was right, y'all could hire me. <laughs> so, and then the head turned <laughs> and they were like, really? What would you come in as? I said, no, hell no. I come in as chief constable of the shire of three people and you pay me 200,000 pounds a year or it's not happening. So clearly I'm still here. Um, we do not have direct entry in the same way that they do in, U in the UK. That said, at the police executive level, you can hire somebody from another police service to come in as an executive. And if the police services board votes and says, yes, that person's acceptable, it's good. We, one of the cheating things we do is we poach people from the UK at higher ranks and we bring them into our police executives. It doesn't happen as often as it used to, but it can still happen. So the police board is an interesting concept. Um, how, how is the board uh, selected? Are they appointed or they're not elected, right? So somebody. No, they're appointed. And so there's a, there's representation from different facets of the community. And it's one of the, in Canada, it's one of those black box mysteries of like, how does this actually happen? Um, I know that the names are put forward to the province. They have some secret black box meetings in which they decide who's acceptable and who's not. And for suddenly one year you might appoint somebody and then two years later they get turfed and i couldn't tell you how why or where what why that occurs so it replaces one political system with another and they probably both have their flaws but it's yeah. not just the the mayor appointing uh the it's not just the police chief serving at the, at the whim of the mayor it's a different there's a intermediate body that has its own scandal and Black box of yes, who knows how those people get there and who they own their loyalties to. But um, yeah, it's, it's a little bit of a buffer between the police chief and the direct uh, sort of the daily whims of politics and the press. Um, a little bit of a buffer. I'd like to see a more significant buffer. I'm actually a big fan of police independence. 
And the reason for that is because we've seen in Canada some very bad um, uses, political uses of police in very scandalous situations. And I'm thinking particularly, I'm dating myself, 1999 in the APEC conference where the RCMP were basically used to occupy uh, the University of British Columbia and led to massive, uh, led to significant arrests of protesters for doing things like holding a sign that says free speech. Um, there's a whole bunch more dirty stuff that went on behind the scenes um, to uh, protect the feelings of, of a dictator who came as part of the APEC conference, but I digress. Um, so as, as a survivor of the APEC time, I'm actually a fan of greater police independence from politicians. My thing is this, if you bring police chiefs in on two to two, three year contracts, if you're not satisfied with the work that they're doing, two, three years, gone. And so that's years. The oversight. Because there, there are these phrases like community policing that you can't be against, right? Um, and one of them is, um, is you know, keep is to keep politi politics out of policing. But then the other one is we want is accountability. And at some point, you can say they're at, you know, you, you can't really have both equally. There is some sort of mini max situation there. But to say we're going to rejudge you in two or three, we're going to put up with you for that time frame. And then, yeah, rejudge seems like a, a decent type of um, compromise. Um, the, I have to ask, going, going back to Skid Row, um, and I, I, when you say Skid Row in a police context, um, I always think of Egon Bittner's classic uh, piece on Skid Row in which he, he kind of, in some ways, like a lot of sociology, it was the sociology of the obvious, but someone's got to say it. And he talked about police discretion and, um, and how that was an essential part of policing, which I think right now is more timely than ever, but it came in, in, in the history of the literature, it, it came after a movement uh, similar to what we're having now, which is um, to limit police discretion. And this came out of the late 60s and the civil rights movement and, and a lot of legal scholars that kind of, I, I think, proposed a unrealistic concept that police were simply neutral arbiters of, of the law. And Bittner said, no, no. Um, a, that's impossible, but B, it's undesirable. We want police to use their discretion. We want them to change behavior. We don't want them writing tickets and arrests uh, to everyone who, who's, who they possibly could. Um, these are, you know, at that time less trained, but they're, they're trained professionals and we want them to know the area and, and, and have responsibility for it. Um, does that, how does that, do you think of that, of, of, of that concept when, when you're dealing with, um, dealing with the communities that you've dealt with and, and, and the supportive reporting concept? Somebody has never read my book. <laughs> Not read your book. <laughs> I read your article, <laughs> the one you wrote. For, for me. Thank you. I am very non-famous for a book that was uh, published in 2007 on policing skid row. And um, Basically, my argument is an updated version of Bittner. You could have said I was feeding you a softball question if you Oh, yeah. Oh, I could have said, oh, okay. Um, but basically, I say the same thing as Bittner. I compare Skid Row policing in Vancouver's downtown east side, San Francisco's Tenderloin, and Edinburgh's um, Cowgate and Grass Market District. Three liberal cities in three and three impoverished neighborhoods with the same type of uh, socioeconomic um, addiction, mental health, and other issues, right? Ostensibly totally comparable, but three very different political styles. And what I conclude at the end of the book is, and I got, man, there was a, there was, I, I won't name the academic, but very big name academic who crapped all over me when I said this. Um, but basically communities get the policing that they want. And when I say that, I don't mean every single person in the community gets it. I say that the majority of the community gets the type of policing they want, which is why policing in Vancouver looks very different. There's the sound of my husband coming home, even though I told him not to come home before 2.30. That's a um, it, it adds character, but, humanizes people. It's good. Well, there you go. But the bottom line is um, in San Francisco, it looks very different 
it is very like U.S. neoliberal style. Oh, actually, it was UPS, even better. <laughs> Who cares about the husband? My first show. You got something, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so that that's why you get these three very different types. Even though every, I mean, I pick three cities that are attached to water. I attached three cities where the inner city area, like, you know, was very dense. Like, I mean, I picked three cities that go to, like, there should be no difference, but there are huge differences because socioculturally cities have different sets of attitudes, beliefs, biases, and so on. And that gets reflected in the style of policing. And when people say, oh, that's not true, um, I say bullshit because there's a reason why LAPD was the way it was in the 1990s. There was enough people that wanted that really sort of paramilitary go in, take names, you know, there were. Yeah, it was the, um, it was the epitome and cra the crash and burn of, you know, Wilson and Culling's uh, professional model of, of, of policing um, going back yeah, to to it's a model that comes from the progressive movement and somehow in the course of the century got co-opted by conservatives. So you go from Volmer to, to Parks to, to, to Daryl Gates um, and then a city in flames. Yeah. And so, and then, so then we see another shift take place, but it doesn't, we see these shifts in cities, but it, I always know that over time, they sort of revert back to whatever their middle, typical middle ground is. So you know, we're going to go through this defund thing and we're going to see certain cities like San Francisco where we're going to do this, that, and the other thing. Mark my words, 10 years from now, we're going to be talking about, do you remember back when San Francisco did all that and then they undid all that? Um, because that's just the, the, that's just how these things roll. But Bittner is a god. He, he in 1967, writing about uh, peacekeeping on Skid Row, Basically, I am still talking about stuff that, that he said in 67 here in 2021, and it's still as relevant today as, as it was then. And one of those aspects has to do with, you said, police discretion. You know, this is a podcast about policing with two academics. Let's talk about Bittner, damn it. We can do that. Um, <laughs> it's my podcast. So the other... Um, piece the Bittner. Now, by the way, let me preface this by saying I actually don't like Bittner's writing stylistically. I, I I warn people that it's a it's a tough read and I kind of it bugs me that he wrote in the style he did. Um, but that said, his concepts are good and I've I it is surprising how they're more relevant than other one was policing on Skid Row uh, about discretion, but and he's the other thing he's famous for, probably more famous for, is his general argument about the function of police in modern society, in which he defines police. And he was writing when? In the late 60s, early 70s? I forget when this stuff yeah. came from. Yeah. Um, he, uh, he defines police, and he has a horrible way to phrase it, but basically um, they are defined by their use of force. Yeah. Um, and or potential use of force, I want to add. It's not that they're defined by beating people up, but if you no. don't, if there's not the potential for the use of force, it's not police work and you don't need police to do it. Um, and I think that's important, particularly today, because I, with the a lot of the reform movement um, from say 20, from Ferguson till this year, it was based on a model that de-emphasized that. Um, you set up perimeter, it's perimeters and you get voluntary compliance and, and, and it, it always bugged me because at some point you got to grab the motherfucker. Um, and whether you do that sooner or later is up to you, but usually doing it sooner is better because there's a, you know, the longer something drags on, the more chance something goes wrong. Um, and that may be keep thinking Bittner. At some point we have cops to use force and force can be ugly, but if we deny that basic premise or pretend it's all touchy feely, do good community policing, um, officer friendly, we're, we're fooling ourselves on that. Um, and that doesn't mean, you know, I'm not saying that the force shouldn't be regulated, accountable and legal and, you know, constitutional or whatever, but that's a part of the job and Bittner framed that argument. Um, but you probably you use Bittner better than I do, I'm sure. You drive me crazy on social media. So this is what happens. I'm innocently minding my own business, doom scrolling through Twitter. And then there's Peter posting all these ridiculous stories out of New York about people that are getting stabbed, shot, beaten to death and everything. And then some moron pipes up and says, 
we should have a violence interrupter go in and teach them about anti-Asian bigotry and that will stop them. Meanwhile, dude's bleeding out because he's been stabbed. At a certain, this is why you drive me crazy because I'm, I wanna reach through the computer and just start shaking people and saying, are you kidding? At the point that this person's been stabbed, we, no amount of training is gonna help that stabbed person, right? Wait till I get on Twitter today because a third person was shot in the Woodside houses. To... <laughs> I'm, we're, we're just we're recording this on uh, March 25th, uh, 2021. Happy Greek Independence Day to all the Greeks out there. So um, my point with this is that it is at a, if you want to carve back to what police do, who they are, Bittner says, calling the cops is the ultimate expression of who police are and what they do. And I actually like that better than the use of force terminology because it also encompasses coercion. When I don't wanna deal with something because I don't wanna go out and start screaming at my neighbor for X, Y, and Z, I call the police who will come and then use the threat of something. And their very presence can be a threat of something. And that resolves the situation peacefully. And so, if we want to like pair back into the policing role, I think going back to that sort of sense of we need the police to do these types of things is a good place for us to start. Yeah, yeah. The, the police role ultimately is getting people to do what they don't want to do or to not do what they want to do. Now, ideally, you can use the old Jedi mind tricks and convince people it's their own choice to do what you want to do, but it is about coercion and part of coercion. And I, I mentioned this again, just to be honest, not to stress it, but yes, there's an element of oppression in that. You want to do something and I'm saying you can't do it. Hopefully you'll change your mind and we can all be friends, but ultimately, no, you, you, you can't do it. Yeah. Um, and that is not, you know, that that's a, all, yeah, it's fine. I want to say no one can be against community policing, but often as community policing is phrased, I know, me too. But I mean, <laughs> I don't want to say that because you, you sound foolish because everyone it thinks it's It sounds like great. you're hating on, uh, you know, the flag and apple pie, right? Or, or advocating a, a, a repressive model of policing, which I'm not, even when I say policing involves repression. Um, that but yeah, the, the reason I should, the reason we're so down on community policing in part is because we know that it's been around um, for 40, 50 years as a concept. And it's always, it means everything to everybody and it ends up meaning nothing. nothing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. I personally think, you know what, at some point, you and I probably, hopefully at ASE, if we ever get there, should sit down Which is and the we criminology conference. the police for 2021 and then we should be like some of our colleagues and we should create a training package and videos <laughs> god that sounds like real work <laughs> terrifies me i know but i have handbags to buy <laughs> <laughs> um anything else on that I, I um this has been great um we've been at it for almost an hour um yeah. so uh, i'm thinking, as you can tell from the tone of my voice, of wrapping it up, but anything else you yeah. want to, on the top of your mind? No, I have to say this was fun. This was like, you know, I like these ones where we take a little bit here and a little bit there. And at the end of it, I feel like, hmm, that's exciting. I might be interested in doing something with that. So I'm now going to go back and read some more Econ Bittner. Sorry. Maybe I should too. I got his book right over there. I can look at it. And maybe I'm, as I'm older, it's, I won't find it so frustrating. Uh, to read his writing, um, but he's, yeah, he's one of the, the classics, the functions of the police. Um, what is the title of your book that I haven't read? <laughs> I think it's called Policing Skid Row. It tells okay. you how to do it that I am. I don't even remember my own book. Do you still use the term Skid Row in Canada? Like it's not a bad term here, we just don't use it anymore. Well, you do in Los Angeles where you actually have signs that say, welcome to Skid Row. Skid Row it's considered not politically correct. However, I've made the argument, and I think it's valid, that you have to retain that because it means something. And whether we try to like dress it up and make it sound pretty and nice and talk about it's a community and, re and so on, ultimately it's a place of heavy marginalization, exclusion, and uh, stigma. And if you don't 
talk about it that way, then you're not invoking all of that. And I don't believe in sugarcoating stuff. Not only are you not invoking it in a way you're ignoring it, it's you can't, we have, yeah. And if we invent a new term, that'll get stigmatized the same way, probably. So it won't even. 100%. So, you know. Well, thank you so much. Um, I am Peter Moskos. I am with Laura Huey, professor at the University of Western Ontario and a contributor to my violence reduction project, which is a collection of essays on a basically short term, medium term uh, solutions to um, reducing violence. Um, and uh, more can be found at uh, the website qualitypolicing.com, which links to this podcast and to the Violence Reduction Project. And um, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed uh, this conversation. So did I. Thank you. Ooh.